Hi there, welcome. I'm Michael Robinson, and uh, this is the Michael S. Robinson Show on Microbin Radio. So, last Sunday was Earth Day, and uh, I think we should continue the conversation about sustainable lifestyle practices since it needs to be a part of our daily lives. So today we're gonna to be chatting about the pairing of wine with the corking of the bottle. Very interesting, usually you talk about the pairing of wine with cheese. So cork has been the traditional bottle stopper used in selling wines for a very long time, but with the concern for the environment and the deforestation in many countries, many vineyards have chosen a different route when it comes to harvesting cork from trees. My guest today believes that cork is good for the environment, good for the emotional enjoyment of wine, and ultimately makes the wine taste better. His name is Peter Weber. He's the executive director of the Cork Quality Council. The Cork Quality Council is a nonprofit organization founded in 1993 to promote education and improve quality assurance performance for the wine and cork industries. Welcome to the show, Peter. Great to be here, Michael. So it's great having you, sir. So let's start by talking about uh, the, the quality of how wine is produced. Now, I know that many vineyards are actually bottling their wines with screw tops. Many are using uh, natural corks and many are using synthetic corks. Let's talk about that. How much of the world uh, uh, production is using natural cork today? Well, the estimates that I, I hear are 70 to 75 percent. I, I know in the United States, um, we track uh, the, the top 100 brands, and we have been doing so since 2010. And we find that uh, actually the use of cork has, uh, uh, has been going up. At, uh, from a, a low point of 51 percent, it's now up to 62 percent in the most recent period. And so we find that the uh, there's you know there's a lot of alternatives, but uh, the use of cork is actually uh, increasing. So basically, uh, the use of cork has declined over the years, right? Uh, it has lost a lot of market value and market share to synthetic closures. Why was that? Well, I think the, <clears throat> I think the synthetics uh, uh, in, in this market anyway started to make their inroads in the 1990s. <clears throat> and there were a lot of reasons. Uh, uh, to some extent, it was uh, uh, cost. Um, it was also, I think, uh, uh, in some ways, the synthetic corks uh, allowed a, a very large winery with a very fast bottling uh, facility to maybe operate a little faster. Uh, and there was a lot of concern about cork taint, uh, which is a off aroma uh, associated with well, it's a very common off aroma, but uh, unfortunately, it became known as, as cork taint, and we, our product became uh, uh, given a verb uh, that we didn't really like to have. But uh, it, it, it's a, it's an aroma you smell when you <clears throat> see wet newspapers or something, and uh, and it's not really an analogy because wet newspapers have TCA. It's very it's a very common uh, uh, compound. It's formed uh, generally when <clears throat> chlorine touches a phenol, which you'll find in any wood or paper product. And when it comes in contact with many different microorganisms, the microorganisms form this TCA as a defense mechanism <clears throat> from the uh, phenols, which generally inhibit uh, bacteria and molds. So it's um, <clears throat> that, that was one impetus. <clears throat> but frankly, the... Uh, the fact is that the uh, most of the alternatives did show up in the very largest wineries, so I think the cost factors uh, were probably a, an equally uh, uh, important reason. I see. So we're going to talk about the the taste of wine when you uh, drink it from a bottle that's corked versus synthetic uh, corking and covers. But for most of us who don't know, how exactly is cork harvested? Well, it's, it's very interesting. It's a very natural product. It's uh, cork is the bark of the cork oak tree. Uh, I mean, it looks like uh, this. I hope you can see that. That's you can see the outside of the um, the bark, and uh, you know the inside is very nice and smooth. Um, and 
The tricky thing is you have to get the cork bark to be as wide as a cork is going to be. Um, so you can see this particular plank is about uh, an inch and a quarter uh, thick, and you can they punch the corks right out of there. So you can uh, I see right through there. And wow. um, the nice thing about this cork is that the lenticels and pathways in the tree come from the bark inside, and that's at a 90 degree angle to the cork itself. So that uh, when you insert this into a wine bottle, um, any channels that are likely to be in the cork are going side to side. So it, it's a it's a good closure going up and down, and that's why it does such a good job sealing the wine bottle. So is is it bad for the tree? I mean, if you're peeling the bark off, most of us will think that eventually the tree will die. <laughs> well, that's a good question. I uh, but the cork oak has uh, very very thick. Uh, 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 bark and uh, it's a very healthy tree. The uh, um, basically uh, to get that one and a quarter inch thick uh, um, piece of bark it takes about nine years through most of Spain and Portugal. Uh, and so every nine years they harvest these trees. They'll do so for over 250 years. And uh, the trees are actually considered healthier when they're stripped. And I'm not sure why, but I you know it could be it's. I don't know. It's maybe it's like getting a spa treatment and have a peel every nine years and get any insects or whatnot that might otherwise uh, progress that would be removed, and you have nice young bark that uh, uh, is, is repeated on a nine-year cycle. So it's sort of like shearing sheep, and it's uh, and that does not injure the sheep, and and the uh, uh, taking the bark off these cork oaks is does not injure the tree at all. So I, I get it that uh, it probably extends the life of the tree, right, when you actually debark it. Uh, and, you know, obviously trees absorb carbon. Is there any scientific uh, understanding of how the cork tree absorbs uh, all the carbon? Well, I mean, it's, it's, mostly, um, it's mostly just photosynthesis. And, uh, um, and I, I think that the studies show that when you take the bark off, that kind of accelerates growth as it forms new bark. And so the, the uptake of, of carbon dioxide is actually somewhat increased by harvesting. So not only does the tree last, uh, live longer, but the, uh, uh, I guess the carbon sink is somewhat uh, uh, increased by this activity as well. Um, why should I recycle? Pardon me? Why should I recycle? For those people oh. who say, oh, you know, it's a fast. Why should I recycle? Well, um, I think re recycling cork anyway is a, is a tremendous uh, good thing to do. First off, uh, um, you know, it, a cork is, is a piece of wood. It is uh, completely uh, safe in a landfill and it, it will decompose as a natural product. But it won't do it overnight. It will take a while. And the fact that you can recycle it um, is very beneficial because there's a, a, a very a strong market for recycled corks. I mean, sure, you, you've probably seen all the hobbyists who make different things out of them, but, but uh, a, a regular wine cork can be shipped to, uh, we call them a, an agglomerating house, I guess, where they would chop them up into little pieces and they use them uh, to make shoes. Uh, they use them to make flooring tiles, ceiling tiles. They use them um, for, I mean, they're actually, they're, they're using these now on the AstroTurfs. They used to throw little chips of uh, ground up tires uh, in, in between the green grass to be the sort of footing that the people would uh, work on and play on. And uh, obviously, uh, you'd rather have a nice little piece of soft, compressible wood than a kind of hot, smelly piece of black rubber because uh, the uh, the fields are are can be twenty degrees cooler in the summer with with the cork in there instead of the uh, rubber. So there's a wide range of uses, and it's I mean there's a demand for these. It's uh, uh, there there are no, numerous companies that uh, uh, make their living selling recycled cork products, and uh, uh, so it's 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 not just a good deed. And it is a good deed, always to recycle, but uh, it's also uh, 
uh, helping people find a product that mm. has a very strong market. In other words, there's a market for recycled cork and uh, certainly makes other products that makes our lives more interesting, whether it's yoga mats, right? Or I heard that there are some uh, products that are being made for the environment in outer space. So uh, it sounds like it's a really good way to go. Let's talk about deforestation because that's a huge concern uh, for many of us. Uh, we think of deforestation as being cutting down trees, destroying trees. Is the cork business helping or hurting the deforestation? Well, it, the cork business is definitely helping that because it, it, uh, it, it's a strong economic motive uh, for people who uh, uh, live in a, in a cork forest environment to protect the cork trees and to keep them going. I mean, it's um, the cork tree is an indigenous tree to Spain and Portugal. So it's it's not sitting around always in some plantation. It's in people's natural uh, woods, and you know, there's pressures throughout Europe or any place else to cut down trees and increase pasture land. Uh, there's uh, sometimes there's urges to replace cork trees with uh, faster growing trees, so they can be turned cut down and turned into paper pulp. But uh, uh, the cork tree is a, a very it's very important economically, and uh, it, it's 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 probably one of the the leading economic uh, engines of the Portuguese countryside for, for many areas, and uh, uh, it, it would not make sense to uh, take those those trees down and replace them with grassland or replace them with sort of a I don't want to say a junk tree. Every tree is nice, but a tree that's going to be uh, grown and cut down in 12 years to be turned into paper. Uh, so it's important. In fact, it's, it's recognized by the uh, World Wildlife Fund that the uh, uh, that they consider the cork uh, forest to be, I think, the second most important forest that they're worried about, and uh, you know, second to the Amazon. Uh, it's certainly no, nowhere near as big, but it's not insubstantial. And the presence of that uh, of that forest uh, is is really the only thing keeping the Sahara Desert from going right up to the Mediterranean Sea. So it's especially important in North Africa uh, as, it, as it anchors the, uh, uh, the grasslands that, that uh, allow agriculture to take effect there. Wow, I did not know that. That's fascinating. So let's talk about fun stuff, right? Does wine taste better when corked, and if so, why? Well, uh, there's, there's a lot of reasons. I, I think it does. Uh, you know, there's, some of the reasons are kind of psychological. There's a recent study out of uh, Oxford where a scientist, a psychologist there was, uh, uh, he was trying to understand the importance of sound to satisfaction. And he had similar wines, poured them for his test subjects. And just before he poured the, the wine into their glass, uh, there would be a popping sound, like a cork was being taken out. And another one, there'd be, uh, I guess, a kind of screwing off sound, like a uh, like a screw cap was being taken up. And um, lo and behold, the people who heard the popping sound, who heard the cork or, or, or envisioned the cork just by the sound of it, um, they thought the uh, they, th they thought that the uh, cork sounding wine was uh, significantly better uh, than the ones without the, the cork sound. So I mean, obviously that's that's an emotional, but there, there's some very good physical chemical reasons why I think uh, wines were cork tastes better than wines without. And the, the key is, is really oxygen. Um, uh, you know, wine, you know, you've heard of oxidized wine, so you clearly can get too much oxygen, and that's going to pretty much destroy the character of the wine and lead to uh, uh, some vinegary-type uh, aromas. But if there's not enough oxygen, uh, wines are often subject to reductive sulfury-type uh, aromas. Um, most people think you need a little bit of oxygen. And uh, when you take a cork, which is uh, 24 millimeters uh, wide right now, and you put it into a wine bottle, it's compressed to 15 millimeters. It's stuck into that wine bottle. And at that point, you now have uh, nine times the normal atmospheric pressure. And so what that means is over about six months, about three milliliters of oxygen 
is going to slowly work its way from cell to cell to cell and into the uh, wine bottle. Uh, so you get this small dose of, uh, of oxygen that takes about six to eight months to, to occur. But after that, your wine bottle's sealed. So it, it's not so much that the cork breathes, it's, it's the cork has like a, a long, slow exhale uh, <laughs> into the wine, and, uh, and it stops. Now, you know, this is kind of the, um, it's probably a, an overgeneralization, but most people uh, agree that the synthetic corks, which have many great uh, characteristics, but, you know, they let oxygen in on a regular basis. And most, most winemakers consider them to be a, sort of an 18-month type product, which is often good enough, you know, but uh, 18 months is not very long. And at that time, your wine is going to be oxidized. That's what I hear from winemakers. And that's kind of what the numbers show uh, when you take a look at the oxygen ingress. Now, screw caps, uh, if you have the, a metal liner, they, don't, they used to not let any oxygen in if they're applied correctly. Uh, but the winemakers were nervous with that. And so lately, most of the screw cap manufacturers are, are coming up with these liners that let in a little bit of oxygen. So they want to get that. They want to get that cork-like uh, dose of oxygen. But the problem there, it's a permeable layer. So the oxygen is going to come in, come in, come in. It's never going to stop. And so uh, the oxygen is limited by when you choose to drink the wine. So that's kind of less control than the cork. Um, and you know, that, that's oxygen. That's, that's a big thing. Some people also think that uh, the fact is that uh, because, because, because this cork is a natural piece of oak, and if you if you analyze it for the same aromas that people uh, analyze cork barrel uh, barrels for, I'm sorry, wine barrels, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of very similar um, flavors. In fact, I, I, last time I did it, I found that the uh, levels of vanilla in the cork were really quite high, and I kind of calculated that you know for some some wines, uh, it might be a significant, uh, you know, portion of the flavor profile that's normally associated with the barrel aging. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of reasons. I think, I think the oxygen is the most uh, logical. And then there's also the emotional uh, side of it and that, uh, um, you know, a lot of people love to take that cork out. They like to save that cork and remember mm -hmm. that special event or that special wine. And you can do that tan you know, tangibly with this, um, and obviously, it's it's nice to know that if you, you know, if you like a wine, you want to save it. Uh, the cork closure will let you do that. So, d does it work for white wine and red wine in the same way, or is it just red wines altogether? Well, it it works perfectly fine with all wines. I think I think that there are some people that uh, uh, think white wines should not develop, and they should be um, they should be consumed almost as they were bottled. And, and frankly, this is something that's uh, fairly new to me. Uh, I, I've been in the wine business for a while. When I came in, we would analyze any wine along a 20-point scale, which would, in, would include uh, flavor development, uh, complexity, uh, and, and things like that. And uh, uh, the cork, I think, helps with that. Uh, I, I find lately uh, some, of, some of the wines... Uh, seem to be evaluated strictly on how much fruit flavor they carry, which is, uh, you know, fruit flavor is good. But, uh, you know, I, I like a Riesling, but I kind of like, say, a German Riesling that has some fruit, but it also has some uh, minerality. It has some, some, some local uh, effects that, that are more complex. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it's, it's sort of a matter of style. And... Uh, um, Cork is great for white wine, and a lot of people who make white wines will only bottle with cork. But uh, you know, there's some people who who think white wine should be basically evaluated purely on how fresh and fruity it is. And for them, I think they want this the wine to be consumed quickly, and they probably don't care much about development. Um, it's a matter of style. So my final question to you is about uh, the authenticity of cork, right? Sometimes you go to buy wine and it's the, the bottle is corked with a plastic or synthetic 
uh, stopper. How do you know the difference between uh, natural cork and something that's synthetic? Should there be some disclosure on the bottle uh, so that the buyer knows the quality of the stopper on the bottle? Well, I wish there would be. Um, uh, it is kind of an issue, and, and I have at various times uh, tried to put together a uh, try to encourage some of the people who do wine lists to have a compendium that show the, the uh, closure type with some success, but not always. But if you go to the supermarket, uh, um, which, which you know, I do too, and I have to make sure, I, I was always afraid if I try to peek under, under the uh, foil, I'll be arrested. Uh, but uh, I do see that some people are using uh, shorter foils so that you can actually see the uh, composition of the cork. Uh, for the bottom uh, quarter inch or so. And I'm seeing more people now in California not use any capsule at all, so you can actually see the cork uh, as part of the design uh, component. And that seems to be get, becoming kind of popular. Um, but uh, I, I have many friends who sell foils for a living, so I don't want to endorse that. Um, but uh, I wish people would note that, either, either by uh, having a uh, portion of the cork be visible uh, or a notation on the uh, back label or something, because it's important to some people. And uh, some people don't care. They just want to have their wine. Some people love the natural cork. They love participating in such a sustainable product. Some people, I guess some places, really like plastic, uh, and they should be able to get what they want. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, sir. I think it's important to have full disclosure when you're buying your, your products these days. Certainly people like myself who believe in sustainability, believe in buying products that are friendly to the environment. And also, you know, hey, you know, a bottle of wine with natural cork is much more tasty from my perspective. I certainly like to smell the cork when I, when I open a nice bottle of wine. So Peter Weber, thank you very much for joining us today. You're the executive director of the Cork Quality Council. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Michael. It was a pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. Bye -bye. I'm Michael Robinson. All the best.